Jay Seculo is with the American Center for Law and Justice. He's their chief counsel. He's also the counsel to the president. And, yeah, he's even had little old me as a client. Um, listen, let me ask you. So I'm looking at this list. I have no idea who the president is going to pick. All I know is this. I want somebody in the vein of a Justice Scalia or a Justin, Justice Thomas who is what we call a constitutionalist or an originalist. I don't right. believe in judicial activism like the left does. Uh, I don't believe that they should cite foreign law like the left does. I don't think they should legislate from the bench, separation of powers, co-equal branches of government, etc. But I do believe whoever gets picked, they're going to try to bork them and destroy them and do what they did to not only Robert Bork, but also Clarence Thomas. I think that is inevitable in this atmosphere. I think that's right. But look, you, you hit the key issue, Sean, and that is the most important question is not how a judge rules on a particular case. Uh, judge Ginsburg then, ultimately Justice Ginsburg, made a statement, and I think she was absolutely correct on this, when she said she's not going to discuss how she might rule on a particular case that could come before her. So that's the, the, the right answer. But you want to know what their judicial philosophy is. How do they view their role as judge? Uh, Scalia famously said uh, that, you know, a, a good judge is going to sometimes come to a conclusion that they don't personally like, but it's what the law demands. So you want that kind of, uh, you know, direct, I would call it a direct sense of their judicial philosophy as it relates to their role as a judge. How do they view themselves in our constitutional uh, framework? How do we, in our constitutional republic, they're an Article Three branch of government. How do they view that role? And that's, that goes to separation of powers. It goes to uh, issues of uh, judicial restraint. It, it goes to judicial philosophy, how they view how they view the role. So that, to me, is always the key. And then the, I don't think we've ever had. I don't. In my, I, I'm trying to think where we ever had in our history a president that pre-announced people on a list while he was running for president, and then updated the list while he was president, and kept that list out there so people could do all the kind of opposition research they wanted to do, but. Um, this president did that, and he said he's going to take someone from the list, and I suspect that's what it will be in a couple hours. Um, so the main thing here is, to me, is that the president, you know, one of the things that is, why this is an imperfect science. People were asking me this weekend, why is it that Republican presidents often think or tell us that they're going to pick a an originalist, a constitutionalist, somebody that believes, uh, as, as Judge Scalia you know, once said, as you rightly point out, that he may actually have to rule a certain way that is against his own personal views, but what the law demands. Um, why is it sometimes Republicans get it wrong, but it seems Democratic presidents never get it wrong? They always get the judicial activists that they've wanted. Because do you ever have to question with someone that's um, being nominated by a Democrat uh, whether, in fact, they're where they stand on the life issue, for instance? I mean, does anybody seriously question, will, you, will that person... Uh, uphold Roe versus Wade. But if you take a contrary view, the, there are people that view that as a disqualifier from public service on the Supreme Court. I think that's sad and tragic. I mean, look, elections have consequences. Presidents get to nominate. That's what, what the Article One power, Article Two power of the president is. They get to nominate. The Senate gets advice and consent, two separate functions. They can weigh in, and then they can vote yes or no. And then if that nominee uh, is successful in getting confirmed, they get their authority from Article 3. So when you have a Supreme Court pick, it puts into place all three branches of our government and all three articles of our United States Constitution. There are certain political considerations that I don't think a lot of people are really factoring in here. I mean, with John McCain being sick, nor yeah. is he a particularly reliable vote for the president at this right. point in his career, that the president must also recognize that he needs Lisa Murkowski of Alaska. Uh, he needs Susan Collins of Maine. He needs Rand Paul of Kentucky on the other side yep. and, and Ted Cruz of Texas. So it's a fine line that the and, and a razor's edge here politically that the president right. is walking because whoever he does pick, he doesn't want to have to either withdraw their nomination or have, have this voted down in the Senate. And so that becomes somewhat problematic for him. As you look at these top four, yeah. maybe five names that we're hearing, is there any one person that you think threads that needle? Um, and the other big issue, Jay, that I'd love you to address is, you know, a lot of these judges, they're great intellectuals. They're writing about the greatest yeah. document ever created, our Constitution. 
And there's a right. lot of nuance. There's a lot of intellectualism. Sure. Um, there's a big judicial philosophy disagreement on originalism versus judicial activism. Right. No, look, Sean, you're hitting the issues that are key. I mean, I'm going to be with you tonight, and uh, you know, we'll know then who the nominee is. But I will tell you this: all of the people on the list, but all the ones, the names that you've raised, um, every one of those would meet the criteria of uh, conservative judicial philosophy, respect for the rule of law, understanding the role that the Supreme Court plays under our Constitution, and I think, without question, would um, support the proposition that judges do not make law. Now, having said that, let me just, this is the politics of it. Is it easier for some than others? It probably is. And that political calculation has to be made by the president when he, because you want the nominee to be confirmed. Can that person be confirmed to that high office? So that's, a, you can't ignore that reality, especially, you know, it, it, gone are the days when uh, Justice Scalia received, I think, 98 votes and Justice Ginsburg, 98 votes. Those days are gone. Everything's now very partisan. Uh, but having said that, I think, you, you, you again, you, that's part of the calculation. You can't ignore it because you ignore it at your own peril. We don't want a situation, actually, that uh, Joe, the late Judge Bork uh, faced. We don't want a situation that uh, Justice Thomas had to go through uh, to be confirmed. You want a straightforward, tough process. I, I, no one doubts that. That it should, that should be thorough. And the, but look, the president's let these people be out there for vetting purposes for over a year, some of them for over a year and a half. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there's no real surprises there. At this point, they've read everything there is to read about them. But you'll hear noises. There's going to be a lot of noise. Look, at 901, we'll know the announcement. At 902, the other side, uh, well, both sides will go to work uh, on, on def either defending the nominee or, or whatever the next role would be. I mean, that's just kind of the nature of, of what happens. Having said that, again, what we're looking for is someone that has a conservative judicial philosophy, and I'm convinced that's what we're going to receive tonight. Why is it, and I've been watching and reading everything about every one of these judges, which I spent a lot of time earlier in the program yeah. uh, talking about, I think the person that interests me the most is, is Judge Amy Barrett, and yet she seems to be the most hated and the most liked by conservatives at this particular point. And, you know, she's a, a Catholic. She has seven kids. Uh, she's adopted a number of kids. Um, she only yeah. recently was put on the U.S. Court of uh, Appeals for the Seventh District. Right. Um, she had a big showdown and confrontation with Senator Dianne yeah. Feinstein and Dick Durbin. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it, it seems that the fact her religious views seem to be in play big time, um, and I and I think there's a certain level of just vitriol and intensity against her. Why? Oh, because of what you said, because of her faith. I mean, she's someone that takes her faith seriously. She's a devout Catholic. She is, uh, she is a person that has, ex well, she doesn't have extensive judicial opinions because she's only been on the court for seven months. She has extensive academic writings. I mean, she was a very well-respected law professor at, um, at Notre Dame Law School. She trained under the great Charlie Rice, late Professor Charlie Rice, who was on our legal advisory board at the ACLJ for decades. And um, she's brilliant. Um, the calculus will be, and the president makes that calculus with his uh, immediate advisors, and they make a calculus as to confirmability and issues like that. And if she's the nominee, that means they're convinced that they can get her uh, confirmed. By the way, if she's not the nominee, it doesn't, doesn't mean that she's not going to be confirmed. It just means that there were other considerations, and maybe it was length of time on the bench. I don't know. We'll see who the nominee is, and, and we'll be able to know. But she is certainly somebody that galvanizes um, a lot of support, in part because of the way she was so uh, – vehemently attacked and, and kept her composure and her dignity during the process. It seems that the the front runner, at least leading up to today, had been uh, Judge uh, Brett, Brett Kavanaugh. Kavanaugh. Yeah. And he's got some very interesting cases. I mean, he was involved in the Heller versus District of Columbia yeah. case in 2011, yeah. and he ended up being on the right side of that case. He dissented. Yeah. Kavanaugh's words, the Supreme Court left, quote, little doubt the courts are to assess gun bans and regulations based on text, history, tradition, not by a balancing test such as a strict intermediate, uh, intermediate scrutiny. But then again, there was, you know, some criticism over over his decisions. There were two of them as it relates yeah, to Obamacare. Yeah. Yeah, and one of them was mine. I mean, it was a case that I, and I've known Brett for a long time. Um, and we've helped on his confirmation to the D.C. Court of Appeals. I've wor wor worked with him in private practice. He, he um, a couple of our religious liberty cases, he, he, he worked on as a lawyer. 
Uh, so he's he's got. I mean, I think on the religious liberty issues, he will be, and uh, his great judicial philosophy on that understands the free exercise, free speech clauses. What about uh, the decision? And I believe it was the the Sissel. Seven Scott. Yeah. Yeah. Well, in the 2015 case, he he would have held that the ACA complied with the clause of the Constitution that requires all bills for raising revenue to originate in the House of Representatives because yeah, the statute. Yeah, clause. Yeah. yeah. Well, but what's interesting about that? It actually held up Obamacare. And the argument that it was a tax, but we were sold that it was not a tax. Yeah, so, I mean, this was an issue that, look, that was in my case uh, that I had, we had in front of him. And he came, he did not address the merits of the constitutionality of Obamacare. That's been misreported. What he addressed was whether the Anti-Injunction Act, passed in 1898, uh, prohibited a proceeding where it was a pre-enforcement, in other words, a, a preliminary injunction, an injunction to stop the enforcement of a tax. And the statute on that, I, I raised this with our team early on because, as you know, Sean, my background is I, I came out of chief counsel's office for Treasury, for the IRS. I was a trial lawyer for chief counsel's office. And um, I was concerned about the issue of the, the tax um, and the Anti-Injunction Act, and that's ultimately where he went. So I don't think it was – I mean, I, I, I don't – think it was a the way it's being portrayed as accurate and um well look you always want to win your case it wasn't an inconceivable conclusion right. that he came up with Let me and take, i don't think that speaks and actually some could argue that's a conservative decision because you don't overreach when you don't have when you don't have statutory authority we'll take a quick break we'll come back more with jay Seculo on the other side all right as we continue with jay Seculo, chief counsel american center for law and justice also counsel to the president let me ask what well, this is an imperfect science in yep. large part and I want you to address this side of it, because by and large, if you're being considered for the Supreme Court, um, you're an intellectual. You, this, you, are deep, you are deep in the weeds as it relates to constitutional law. And when you read decisions, you know, on the surface, maybe the outcome is based on an entirely different way of thinking than most Americans would understand. But again, we're looking towards judicial philosophy. There, there are nuances to some decisions. Sure. And, to and most decisions. To most decisions, yeah. Yeah. So, and part of that, and part of that nuance, as you, you call it, I think that's a good term, is that they're, they're courts of, of limited jurisdiction in one sense, and that they don't reach to issues that they're not supposed to hit uh, if, if they've got a conservative judicial philosophy, so they don't overstretch. And part of that process is an understanding that when you're looking at this, that what you're dealing with is a, how, what you want to know is, how does the judge view their job? How do they view their role as a judge? And that really becomes the critical aspect of all of this. How do they view their role in, in, as a judge? Are they call in balls and strikes, or are they coming up with policy that they like? If they're policy-oriented, then they should be running for legislature or for the presidency. They shouldn't be running. They should not be nominated as a judge. That's not their role. So that's where it becomes very, very important. Okay, and so I guess at the end of the day, as we look at the names, and again, I think you're rightly pointing out a very important point. There's never been a president that has actually given a specific no. list of names and sticks to the list of names that he's been yep. telegraphing now since he, before he got elected. Um, so in that sense, there won't be any surprises. Are you confident at the end of the day that we're going to get somebody like an Alito, like a Clarence Thomas or Scalia on the Supreme Court in this choice? I think on the, that entire list are individuals of impeccable credentials with conservative judicial philosophies, and I think we should be comfortable with anybody on that list. And I, I expect that tonight we'll be very pleased with who the nominee is. Again, it's ultimately, there's one thing that's very clear about Article 2. This is the president's choice. It's not the Federalist Society. It's not Leonard Leo. It's not uh, the Heritage Foundation. Uh, Kay James. It's not the American Center for Law and Justice and Jay Sekulow. Okay. This is the president's choice. All right, Jay Sekulow, thank you for being with us.